So Vanessa Brooks is a mental health professional and doctoral candidate researching African-American clergy attitudes towards theology, mental health, and religious coping in the Black church. She is the owner of Brooks Consulting and Training Solutions, which is a mental health wellness and personal development consulting company. Vanessa is also the creator of the Religious Trauma Recovery Program, and we're so lucky to have her presenting today. So Vanessa, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. So give me just a moment, everyone, and let me share my screen, and hopefully all of the technology will love me today. So before I begin my presentation, I do want to extend a thank you to Dr. Darren Slade and the Global Center for Religious Research for extending this opportunity to us to discuss the very serious problem of mental health and religious trauma in the Black church. Today, I will be presenting uh, on the topic of exploring clergy attitudes about mental health in the African-American church. Subtopic, if you will, is religious trauma from the African-American perspective. That is me. For those that don't know, my name is Vanessa R. Brooks. I am a Master of Arts Pastoral Counselor degree from Houston Baptist University, and I am currently also a doctoral student at that same school, Houston University, Houston Baptist University, pursuing a Doctor of Education in Executive Leadership in Behavioral Health Management. Um, I am an entrepreneur, as uh, has already, already been stated. I own Brooks Consulting and Training Solutions, where I serve as a mental health and religious trauma educator, personal development uh, mentor as well. So before I go into my presentation today, I want to just give a really quick history of, my, of me and why this is important to me. I am 53 years old and until uh, up until 2019 um, my life was the church i was born and raised in the black church uh, i started out at uh, my home church the baptist church in a small southern town in north carolina uh, i was raised by a beautiful god-fearing woman and i really had a, a great experience in my baptist church uh, the trauma for me did not start until I got the uh, inclination to leave my home church and um, become a part of what's known as the Pentecostal uh, deliverance, um, very evangelical um, church. That is where I began to experience what I now can articulate as uh, religious trauma. And it is where, for me, uh, the process of deconstruction began uh, even prior to uh, leaving uh, ministry. Uh, I now that I have language for what was happening, I was deconstructing probably from the very first moment of my personal experience with Christianity. I went on to become uh, not just a minister uh, in the church, but I became, along with my husband, a pastor. We were founding pastors and planted a couple of churches that we uh, pastored for 14 years. And then in 2019, uh, what I now can call a crisis of faith <laughs> uh, culminated um, and I felt led to uh, retire from pastoring. So we closed our church in 2019. And that is when the very intense uh, journey of deconstructing for me began. Um, but because I love the black church, I love um, what it means to our community. I didn't want to become a bitter uh, deconstructioner. I don't know if that's a word, but it's a word now. Um, I wanted to make a difference in the community. And so um, it was then that I decided to uh, enroll into this doctoral program because I wanted to take more of an academic approach to the deconstruction journey for myself. I wanted to uh, be able to look at the Black church experience from an academic, non-biased perspective rather than from an angry, uh, traumatized perspective. And so that is what brings me to the space on today. And this, uh, this conference today, this international conference today, um, it is the first of many that I hope to have the opportunity to participate in. Um, it is my dream, my goal, my desire to be able to present um, more um, 
so that we can raise awareness to these conversations in the African-American community, because these are conversations that are just not normalized in my community and they're very sensitive. And so I'm hoping that um, the space that I hold will be one that contributes to not just more academic knowledge of this topic, but that one, one that will um, bring healing to the African-American experience. So that is my that is my story. <laughs> so let's get into the objectives of the presentation for today. We have four objectives for today's presentation. We want to begin looking at religious trauma from the African American perspective. Um, for me, this is important because, as I just shared with uh, Darren um, offline, uh, when I got into this space, one of the things that became very obvious to me was that this conversation was not one being had in the African-American community. Um, although many of us uh, as African-Americans uh, had questions about our faith, I think every Christian has questions about their faith. It's not that we didn't have questions or that, that we were not secretly questioning, but it was absolutely taboo to have these questions, to, 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 to voice these questions out loud. And terms like religious trauma uh, and deconstruction were just not terms that I was familiar with. They're not terms that are being frequented in the African-American communities. And so I knew immediately uh, coming into this space that I was going to be a voice that could uh, raise awareness to these conversations and normalize these conversations and make it comfortable for African-Americans to have these conversations so that we can get the healing that we need. So we're gonna talk about religious trauma from the African-American perspective. And I'm also hoping that even um, Caucasian people in this space will respect our experience and, and give more voice to the African-American experience in terms of religious trauma, some things that I don't hear the, the, the white community talking about in this space. Um, my second objective is to talk about the correlations of religious trauma and mental health. Um, it, it was became it became uh, really apparent to me early on in my research that there was an intersectionality between uh, these two uh, disciplines of at least African American experience. Uh, mental health um, and religious trauma are both uh, highly taboo topics in the Black community. Um, but they ironically intersect. And so we wanna talk about that today. Third, the implications of clergy attitudes towards mental health. Uh, being an ordained minister myself, this is important to me. I remember as a, as a pastor, um, how uh, disengaged I was from the conversation of mental health in the church, um, how we were really quick to demonize anything that that I now understand understood to be or understand to be mental health. And so I think it's important for us to, to look at those implications and what does that mean to the African American uh, in the church who is experiencing mental health? Um, how does the attitudes that clergy have about mental health affect those people who are suffering in the church? And then finally, we want to close the presentation out with looking at some possible um, healing religious trauma strategies. So I want to begin the presentation with this photo. Uh, and the caption, I hope that you all can see it here. The caption says, religious trauma for African-Americans began 500 years ago with chattel slavery in America. I almost changed my topic title to this today, but for the sake of being consistent, I chose not to. And this is where I think religious trauma is a completely different conversation for African-Americans than for any other population, at least here in America. For us, religious trauma is not just about the authoritarian, authoritarian um, leadership or dogmatic doctrines, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, what I want to add to that definition and to make it more inclusive of uh, the African-American experience is that for us, it is a 500 year old trauma that we are living with even to this day. And if you look at this photo, this photo sort of lays the foundation for my conversation today. Uh, you can find this uh, image on the internet. It's a very popular image, but it's a very um, soul-stirring, um, almost painful in, uh, image for me to look at even today. Still, I can feel the nervousness in my in my body when I talk about this po this photo. But here you see a black man. He's clergy. He's a minister. 
Uh, he is standing on the pulpit, on the podium. Uh, he's about to deliver the message to the church. He's a slave and he was credentialed. He was licensed for, minister, for ministry by his white slave master, who if you can look at this picture, is sitting in the midst of the congregation. This is what church looked like for black people uh, during the days of slavery. Uh, slaves were forced to worship with white, their white slave owners and the white slave mass, uh, families that they served. And they were all expected to worship the same God. If you look at the photo, you have the white family on the left, you have the black enslaved people on the right of the minister and right in the middle of the congregation, you have the slave master. Again, on the podium is the black minister who is now going to preach the word that his slave master has taught him to preach. Only select scriptures were allowed to be preached and those scriptures had to do with uh, the glorification of being a slave. So this is the foundational conversation for black people when we start talking about religious trauma. So for us, the trauma began 500 years ago, uh, being forced to worship in the same space as our abusers, being forced to worship the same God as uh, the exact same people who were lynching our husbands, lynching our fathers, being forced to worship the same God as the individuals who were um, uh, raping our women, raping babies. Uh, this is where the trauma began for us. When you think about the modern definition of religious trauma, uh, most of you are familiar with Marlene Wynell. Her website is journeyfree.org, which is where I pulled this definition from. And her definition says that religious trauma is the condition experienced by people who are struggling with leaving an authoritarian dogmatic religion and coping with the damage of indoctrination. I hope that Ms. Wynell sees my presentation and that she'll consider adjusting the definition of religious trauma to include um, the chattel slavery, uh, the, the trauma that we've experienced as black people. And I'm gonna get more into um, the theory of um, that trauma in just a little bit. I do wanna mention the word indoctrination because that's, a, that's an important uh, component of religious trauma because for people who are, in who are traumatized by um, the religion itself, that is uh, because of the indoctrination uh, that we go through. Uh, the word indoctrination is defined as the process of teaching a person or a group of people to accept a set of beliefs without critical thought or consideration of the validity of the teachings or beliefs. So most of us who've experienced religious trauma can relate to that definition of indoctrination, that the tenets of Christian faith were accepted by many of us without giving any critical thought or without considering the validity of those teachings or those beliefs. My intention today and for the work that I do in general is to connect this modern understanding of religious trauma to the oppressive and abusive plight of African Americans' 500 year history of spiritual abuse. So for African Americans, religion was weaponized and used to oppress and enslave millions of black people in America. For the black church, um, for many, the black church is a place of healing and transfer transformation, but unfortunately, there is also a dark history of pain and suffering associated with the black church as well. And so I wanna have a brief conversation now about church and slavery. So during slavery, many plantation owners forbade more than five slaves together at one time without supervision by a white overseer. We see that in that photo. The white overseer is sitting right in the midst of the worship service. Although slaves possessed a desire for religious and spiritual expression, this rule complicated their ability to assemble for worship services and it stifled their sense of community and their opportunities for fellowship. So in fear of repercussions for breaking these rules, slaves resorted to informal worship gatherings in secret locations such as swamps and wooded areas. Eventually during the mid 1700s, these informal gatherings became less secretive and more visible. 
And it laid the foundation for the institution that would become known as the Black Church. So when you hear me mention the term Black Church, it's not that I'm trying to single us out, but this is the foundation of where that name came from. Africans, uh, enslaved Africans need to want to worship free of spiritual abuse. And so this is how the Black Church was birthed. It was birthed out of pain. It was birthed out of oppression. It was birthed out of a desire to discover a God that did not ordain enslavement and oppression and abuse and violence and murder and rape. This is the birth of the Black Church. So the Black churches became the epicenter of the slaves community and a place of education and fellowship. Uh, we lacked these types of opportunities on the plantation. And so you can imagine why the Black church became this epicenter. And if you can, if you can allow yourself to understand, this is why even today, the Black church is the epicenter of Black communities because historically we have not had any other um, communal institutions to become educated in a way that aligns to our personal experience. And so for many people, even today, um, the church is the epicenter. It is the pillar of the to understand why that is. So during the genesis of the black church, plantation owners feared that if slaves were able to read the Bible, their proclivity to defer hopes of freedom until after death would decrease. So remember, because of the torture that enslaved people were experiencing, um, one of the reasons why they were succumbing to these worship services is because they were looking forward to death. They were looking forward to a time when they could leave this earth and go be with God because they were under so much torture and so much suffering. And so slave masters really were trying to ensure that, that Black people never learned to read the Bible comprehensively um, because they feared that they would get the total story as opposed to the partial story that the slave masters were teaching them. So slave masters feared that the slaves would acquire a comprehensive knowledge of scripture that would illuminate the flaws and the biblical inconsistencies found in, in the Bible. With a comprehensive knowledge of scripture, uh, the slave masters feared that the slaves would have an increasingly difficult time reconciling a biblically, biblically based system of enslavement of innocent people. And as you might predict, the slaves eventually became disconnected with their situation and they used the church as a means to bring about change. This was something that brought a level of healing to me uh, going through my deconstruction and going through my healing journey. And it allowed me to uh, reignite my respect for the black church. Um, what a lot of people don't understand is that our um, our incredible allegiance to the black church is not necessarily because we are in love with the, with the things the Bible say, but our, our allegiance to the black church has more to do with, it was a means for us to escape the torture of slavery. As slaves scriptural knowledge grew, so did their frustration with organized religion, particularly Christianity. Slaves begin to view Christianity as another vehicle used by whites to advance oppression. This is where you get uh, things like hoodoo. Um, hoodoo is a religious system that is still practiced in America today. And it is a combination or an integration of African spirituality and Christianity. And so Africans, uh, the African slaves found parts of Christianity that resonated with them and they kept those parts and they combined it with their African traditions, the things they were practicing prior to being transported here uh, during the um, slave trade. So slave masters and their families treated slaves poorly, even though they worshiped together in the same buildings. Again, as you saw in the photo earlier, instead of church being a safe, ha a sacred haven or a safe haven away from maltreatment, it was another opportunity for whites to exert their power which became overwhelmingly overwhelming for the, the black slaves. And so eventually these slaves started their own separate worship spaces from their slave masters, which is how we got the black church today. These services provided therapeutic relief and a departure from the pressures and brutality experienced on the plantation. So again, 
when we start thinking about mental health, and we'll have this conversation in just a little bit, I want you to understand and begin to remember when you hear me say things later on, why Black people are resistant to mental health. It dates back to the days of slavery. So for, for the church experience in the Black community, church was not so much about biblical um, expression as it was about a safe haven to receive sort of therapeutic relief from all of the oppression, all of the abuse. Now that we are in more modern times and we understand things like epigenetics, um, how we are, how we can inherit trauma. Uh, we understand things like um, how our nervous system holds trauma. We understand how our bodies can heal uh, by releasing um, energies and trauma. You can understand why then Black people found so much therapeutic relief uh, in going to these church services where they could shout, they could clap, they could scream to the top of their lungs, they could cry, they could pray to, to the God they believed in because they were really trying to get therapeutic relief for the suffering that they had experienced and the brutality that they had experienced. So in essence, church services and religious and spiritual resources operated much like counseling sessions. I want you to remember this because that 500 year history has traveled with us today. And it is still the reason why black people don't seek out mental health professionals for um, help seeking. OK, so I'm going to say that again. Church services and religious and spiritual resources operated much like counseling sessions. OK, I want you to remember that slaves found hope in the scriptural promises of a future void of oppression. This breaks my heart. They look forward to death as a transition from suffering on earth to a promise of reward and deliverance in heaven. Even today, heaven is a topic that's, that's off limits in the black community. One of the things I had to understand as I was going through my deconstruction and I was really trying to teach some truths about uh, topics such as heaven, um, there was so much resistance and I turned so many people away and I really didn't understand why, but I understand why now, because historically, again, when you think about epigenetics and how we we, tra we we can inherit the beliefs of our ancestors, we were born with a lot of these beliefs already inherently within us. And so to try and even imply that heaven is not an option for African-Americans would cause them more trauma. One of the things that I'm practicing now that I'm on this journey is trying to become a, to, to try to be a trauma informed leader. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to re traumatize individuals as we're going through these deconstruction practices. As we're online and we're sharing certain information, I just ask that, especially those of you who are in the African American space and you're deconstructing, because there's a lot of us, I've connected to a lot of us but we need to be sensitive when we're sharing information because a lot of the things that we are sharing, we're actually uh, putting our, our community at risk of re-traumatization. So let's be careful with some of the things that we're sharing and how we're sharing the information. Slaves especially could relate to the persecution and torment of Jesus Christ, who is the pivotal figure of Christianity. So again, one of the things that you cannot touch in the African-American space is Jesus Christ. Um, these are things that I didn't think about when I was in my early journey of deconstructing and I was just online teaching and, and talking and sharing and it was, it was hurting people. And I, and I really couldn't understand why I was like, why aren't people excited about the data that I'm sharing, the information I'm sharing. So I had not made the connection between trauma and religion. So again, a lot of these concepts for African-Americans it is what we have had to rely on to keep our sanity, to keep our peace, um, to prevent mental health breakdowns. And so, again, for those of you who are in the deconstructing space, um, I'm talking to myself as well. These are some things that we have to consider when we're sharing information because we might risk re-traumatization. Um, so, in fact, slaves likened the crucifixion experienced by Christ to the popularized practice of lynching Black men. So there is this allegiance um, to Jesus Christ or that story because these, these slaves were witnessing or had witnessed their husbands, their brothers, their sons 
be lynched on a tree um, and hung there sometimes for days before they were taken down. Um, it was customary for white families after attending church services to come in and just observe lynched bodies. And so when these Africans found this story in the Bible about Jesus's crucifixion, they connected to that immediately. And they felt like they understood Jesus. They felt like Jesus was a part of their lived experience. And so let's just understand that when we're, when we're talking about deconstructing and why you might get resistance from African-Americans when you're trying to encourage them to deconstruct from certain aspects of Christianity. I don't know that it's wise to do it in that way for this reason. All right, so correlation of religious trauma and mental health. So I don't know if African-Americans or even white Americans realize or just the world in general that we are in a mental health crisis in the black community. Um, the crisis of depression in America has reached an all-time high, affecting over 14 million adults each year. But we're going to get into the specifics of how that's affecting African-Americans, since that's the conversation we're having today. So bear with me as I just go through some very important data, again, because I'm trying to get us to understand the correlation between religious trauma and mental health. So according to Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I'm going to read from the, uh, the SAMHSA's 2018 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. These statistics are alarming. So 16%, which is roughly 4.8 million African-American people, reported having a mental illness. That's 4.8 million African-American people in 2018 reported having a mental illness. And 22.4% of those people, which is roughly about 1.1 million people, reported a serious mental illness over the past year. Serious mental illness, or what's known as SMI, increased among all ages of Black and African-American people between the years of 2008 and 2018. Major depressive episodes increased from 9% to 10.3% in African-American youths ages 12 to 17. That is alarming to me. 6.1% to 9.4% in young adults ages 18 to 25, and from 5.7% to 6.3% in the 26 to 49 age category. This is all between the years 2015 and 2018. So just in the last three years, we've seen these major spikes in depressive episodes in African-Americans of all ages. Suicidal thoughts, suicidal plans, and suicide attempts are also rising among Black and African-American young adults. 9.5% or 439,000 African-Americans ages 18 to 25 years old had serious thoughts of suicide in 2018. I don't hear this preached in our churches, y'all. <laughs> compared to 2.1% uh, or, I'm sorry, compared to um, 6% or 277,000 in 2008. 3.6% or 166,000 African-Americans made a suicide plan in 2018. And that's compared to 2.1% or 96,000 in 2008. And 2.4% or 111,000 African-Americans made an attempt to commit suicide in 2018 compared to 1.5% or 70,000 in 2008. So suicide attempts, suicide plans are on the increase in African-American communities by very large numbers. Binge drinking, smoking, and that includes cigarettes and marijuana, illicit drug use, and prescription pain reliever misuse are more frequent among Black and African-American adults with mental illnesses. So let's talk about treatment, because this is going to explain some things in terms of uh, why Black folk really rely on the church for their mental health um, treatment needs. So African-Americans uh, are more often diagnosed with schizophrenia 
and less often diagnosed with mood disorders when compared to white people with the exact same symptoms. I just want you to digest that for a second. So if a white man and a black man showed up at a mental health facility with the exact same symptoms, it's more likely that the professional, mental health professional will diagnose the black man with schizophrenia and diagnose the white man with a mood disorder. And this next piece of data just breaks my heart. Additionally, they are offered medication or therapy at lower rates than the general population. So when mental health professionals are diagnosing and misdiagnosing black people with schizophrenia, they're also not prescribing medication or therapy for these people. So they're being turned away back into the community with these untreated diagnoses. Another problem, less than 2% of American Psychological Association members are black or African Americans. So there is a worry that mental health care practitioners are not culturally competent enough to treat their specific issues. So most of the mental health professionals are non-black. So then black people feel like mental health professionals are not apt to treat them because there is a barrier there, a cultural barrier there, which causes more stigma. Stigma and judgment prevent black and African-American people from seeking treatment for their mental illnesses. Research indicates that blacks and African-Americans believe that mild depression or anxiety would be considered crazy in their social circles. I've heard that a lot all my life. We use the word crazy very loosely in, in the African-American community. And so nobody wants to feel like they're crazy. So most times when people do feel they have an issue, they keep it to themselves. Furthermore, many believe that discussions about mental illness would not be appropriate even among family. Stigma of mental illness is considered a widespread threat to public health and communities in the United States, but it's, it's even more impactful among racial and ethnic minority groups, such as African-Americans. Stigma leads to a number of harmful uh, sequelae, including a tendency for individuals with mental illness to avoid seeking treatment, being secretive about one's mental illness and withdrawing from others. Here's the part that where the religious trauma can, can, can connect that dot. So because of all of the disparities that African-Americans face and the stigmas, uh, we choose to seek spiritual intervention from clergies rather than mental health professionals. I saw this a lot as a pastor, trying to counsel people who I knew had some type of mental health, knowing that I wasn't qualified to even have that conversation, but feeling the pressure to do it. Um, and this happens a lot in the African-American church. Okay. So the connection of mental health and religion cannot be overlooked in discussion of mental health stigma. So we have to have the conversation about mental health and religion. It cannot be ignored because again, there's a parallel, there's an intersect there. Religion may sometimes result in negative consequences for individuals with mental illness due to stigma perpetuated by harmful messages by some congregations and clergies. So this ties back to Mar uh, Marlene Wynell's definition where she talks about uh, the, the dogmatic doctrines. So this is where this can also affect African-Americans because if, um, if we hear sermons about mental health and are told that it's a demon or that it's because we're in sin or because we lack faith, um, this is going to perpetuate even more resistance to us seeking help. So congregations may also become a source of stress for those who are struggling with mental health concerns through community criticism, ultimately caused by stigma. Uh, we see this a lot where if one person in the church is having some type of issue, uh, the congregation gets wind of it, and then there's discussion about that individual. And again, this creates more um, resistance. 
Speaking openly about mental health can lead to criticism and rejection from the religious community causing increased uh, psychological distress. It's, it's, it's a taboo and it is not to be discussed openly. And if you do try to discuss it openly, uh, most times you're going to get reprimanded by clergy or church leaders. African-Americans struggling with depressive symptoms are more likely to seek out counseling from clergy rather than treatment with antidepressant medications or mental health counseling. So again, when you think about our history uh, with the church and with the with slavery, you, you can begin to understand why even today there's still a struggle for African-Americans to seek out mental health professional counseling. This brings me to a very important topic to kind of tie all of this together. I want to talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome and historical trauma. So in a peer-reviewed study conducted by Wynetta Wimberly, this article titled The Culture of Stigma Surrounding Depression in the African-American, uh, this article was published in the Journal of Pastoral Theology in 2015. It's a very good read. Um, she discusses her belief that the African, uh, that the American transatlantic slave trade industry is a historical trauma and a, a major factor for depression in African Americans. So this is a theory that she has come up with. It's called historical trauma theory. And this theory theorizes that the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanates from massive group trauma experiences. This theory is also supported um, in Dr. Joy DeGruy's work. You see the book here in the, in the photo. So in Joy DeGruy's theory of post-traumatic slave syndrome, she contends that African-Americans sustained multi-generational psychological and emotional trauma from the systemic racism and oppression emanating from slavery. Dr. DeGruy argues that despite the much lauded resiliency of enslaved and freed African-Americans, there remains a multi-generational component of psychic trauma that perpetually traumatizes individuals within familial, communal, and societal context. So what we need to understand is, and again, epigenetics, which is one of the newer sciences, proves that this theory is true. I've stated this a few minutes ago that we know now that our experiences, our uh, emotional experiences, our traumas can be inherited through um, our mothers. Um, and so these theories coincide with epigenetics. And so when you think about 500 years of the trauma of enslaved ancestors and what they experienced and those mothers and those fathers passing that trauma on to uh, their offspring, that we would be born, inherently born with some of these same triggers and some of these same traumas and some of these same beliefs. So again, this is why there is this intersection between um, mental health and resistance to getting mental health treatment and our allegiance to the church. Uh, one of the things that she points out here is that families and marriages move from generation to generation and they develop patterns for responding to crisis. So when you think about church and how devoted we are to church, you can see that our devotion to church, religiosity, which includes things like attending church services, prayer, scripture, songs, music, praise, all of these can be considered uh, as developmental patterns that we've that we've adopted, that we've uh, that we've inherited for how we're going to respond to life crisis and any life transitions that we're going through. These are passed on from generation to generation. The belief that African-Americans are to espouse resilience as a means of honoring the legacy and upholding the dignity of enslaved and freed African-Americans also promotes cultural trauma of slavery. And those of you who are in the African-American community, you all know we hear this a lot. For those of you who are not in the community, what we hear all the time is that we are expected to be resilient. We are expected to be resilient 
Okay. And so there is a presupposition in the African American community that we're supposed to be strong, that we're supposed to be resilient because we're supposed to uphold the legacy of our, of our enslaved ancestors. And so this produces uh, more cultural trauma uh, for African Americans. Um, some other issues that we have in terms of cultural trauma, and I've mentioned this, but uh, one of the main problems for Black people is that we've been taught to see mental health as a weakness. Um, and within our communities, weakness is just not an option because again, we are supposed to be strong and we're supposed to be resilient at all times. Another issue I wanna briefly mention is that when Black families do uh, seek help, it's often not self-referred. So in other words, statistically, when we do go uh, seek help for mental health assistance, it's not because we want to. Oftentimes we are sent for treatment by uh, referrals. So it could be a school referring a child or the courts referring someone or a hospital referring somebody or a social welfare agency referring someone. So again, this feeds into this notion that there's something wrong with me because I'm being referred. And so that puts African-Americans under considerable threat and, and pressure, um, and it really strips them of their dignity. Implications of clergy attitudes towards mental health in the Black church. So how does trauma from Black churches show up? Given the potential for negative influences of religion on mental health, clergies are in a key position to affect congregational views about mental health illness and help seeking. In the African-American experience, clergy are regarded as highly influential people. And so how they think about mental health and illnesses is imperative to how we're gonna move forward in our community. This is why I'm doing this work because I really want uh, African-American clergy to understand the influence that they have on the black community. So first we need to understand the overarching view of many, not all, but many African-American clergy regarding mental health. Uh, as I just stated, clergy are respected community members who serve as the mouthpiece of their religious organizations. And so they convey institutional and denominational views about mental illness. And so the fundamentalist ideology that predominates certain religious traditions leads to congregation members accepting their clergy's opinion as correct due to this notion that we're not supposed to question authority, even if they include stereotypes and unhealthy beliefs. Additionally, research shows that Protestant and non-denominational uh, Black Christian churches are more likely to believe in historical views of mental health, such as they believe the etiology or the cause of mental health issues is spiritually oriented as opposed to it being psychologically or biologically oriented. And this makes for some very difficult um, situations because, again, uh, if pastors and clergy and ministers and, and church leaders, if they don't understand the correct etiology of mental health, if they don't understand that depression and, and anxiety and schizophrenia and other mental health illnesses are caused by biological causes or psychological causes, if they don't understand that, that means they're not, they're not going to offer effective treatment for parishioners. If clergy associate mental health with, again, things like the belief in demons or demon possession, or if they believe the cause of depression or schizophrenia or anxiety is because of sin or lack of faith, they're going to treat the so-called illness through that lens. And so they're going to offer things like prayer, and they're going to offer things like scripture, um, and they're going to offer strategies about how to come out of sin. And those things, and I'm not here to talk about whether those things are right or wrong, but I'm saying those things do not address what's happening psychologically or biologically in terms of the person's depression or mental health issue. So due to clergy holding this sort of authority and influence over congregation members' lives, how clergy respond to people's concerns impacts the congregation's perception and behaviors towards their own health and mental health. So if clergy believe that it's a demon, guess what? The people in the audience, in the congregation are gonna believe it's a demon. 
If clergy believe that you're going through this thing because of sin, if that's what clergy believe and if that's what clergy say, guess what? Congregants are going to believe that as well because, again, congr- uh, cur- clergy have that level of authority and influence over congregation members. Okay, so congregation members tend to have the same attitudes and perceptions and behaviors towards mental health as their clergy do. So here's another issue, and I think these numbers are increasing. I'm doing some research on this, but uh, another problem is that less than half of African-American clergy have training in clinical pastoral counseling. So I am one of those people. Now in 2017, I got a master's degree in pastoral counseling. Pastoral counseling, technically, if you don't have a degree, then the counseling that you're providing is not pastoral counseling. And I don't think this is this is a known fact in the black church. So when we talk about pastoral counseling, we're really talking about professional counseling, which we're talking about psychotherapy. So the degree that I have is one in psychotherapy, but it's in in theology. Most African-American clergy don't have that. So when they they counsel individuals, they're doing what's called informal counseling, which is really pastoral care. So this is something that we have to really raise awareness to in the church as well, because technically, if you're not a professional pastoral counselor, you're really not supposed to be counseling individuals who have things like depression or other mental health illnesses. And this is something that I really want the black church to understand that when we try to cast a demon out of someone who really has a mental health illness, we're causing more traumatization. We're causing more harm because we don't understand the very, the very thin line between professional clinical pastoral counseling and informal clergy counseling. Another issue, at a very early age, we as African-Americans are taught to lean on God when we're enduring hardships and difficult situations. And so many African-Americans sort of see clergy as the bridge between themselves and God, like we need an intercessor, right? So that's another another thing that has to be addressed is that um, even if you're going to use things like religious coping as a way to deal with your mental health um, challenges, we've got to get clergy to, 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 to encourage individuals to use their own ability to uh, practice those religious coping mechanisms as opposed to just relying on their pastor or other clergy members to do that for them. Several studies reveal that African-American clergy lack knowledge about the biological and psychological causes of depression. There are several studies on that. And in my notes, I have so many references that I'm citing. I'm not going to go through all those here, but I want you all to know that I'm not giving you information that I just think is true. Um, All of the stats that I'm providing for you all today, all the data has been peer reviewed and there are many, many studies about everything I'm saying today. So in fact, African clergy overwhelmingly state that their pastoral counseling approaches are theologically grounded in the beliefs that depression is the result of spiritual poverty, demonic oppression, personal sin, and a lack of faith. Clergy with a more theological based view about depression and other mental illnesses are less likely to recognize the symptoms and the levels of severity of mental illnesses. And so therefore they render less effective counseling That is so important for clergy to understand. If you don't understand the causes of depression and other mental illnesses, that means you're not gonna recognize the symptoms and how severe the person's suffering is. And you're gonna more than likely render ineffective counseling towards them, which means the person's suffering is prolonged. I already gave you the statistics of how many African-Americans are attempting suicide. I gave you the statistics on how many African-Americans rely on coping using drugs and marijuana and other illicit drugs, right? So when people have mental illnesses that are unresolved, untreated, they're going to resort to things like suicide and drug and alcohol dependency because they want relief. I need us to understand that as an African-American community. So 
So furthermore, uh, additional research uh, shows that the lack of understanding of the causes of depression significantly alter clergy's perceptions and treatment approaches. Clergy without previous exposure and understanding about depression were more likely to use spiritual interventions, again, such as prayer, reading of scripture and counseling, focus on God as the only one who can relieve the symptoms. I want y'all to think about that. And this conversation is not, not about whether you should believe in God or not. That is a personal decision that, that has nothing to do with today's conversation. I just want people to understand that when you tell another person who, have, who is suffering from a mental health illness, that God is the only one who can help them. Just think about how much pressure you are now putting on that person. And if they can't get a response from God, if they've prayed and if they read scripture, if they've done all these things and they're not getting any relief, you can imagine how that person might be led to try more dangerous uh, solution strategies such as unaliving themselves. I'm getting towards the end of my presentation. I wanted to end it today by talking about ways we can heal religious trauma. To the right is my program. It's the Religious Trauma Recovery Program. And I created this back in 2021, uh, really just me documenting my own journey of healing for myself. Because when I left the church in 2019, I couldn't find anything out there uh, that I felt a connection to as an African-American woman. Again, most of the resources that are available uh, concerning religious trauma, uh, to me, they just, they felt more, um, uh, they, they, it, it felt like they were told from the experience of non-African Americans, if I can put it that way. I didn't really feel a connection. And so I decided to create something that, that I felt a connection to. So I want to talk a little bit more about religious trauma uh, in, in, this, in this part of the presentation. Uh, so religious trauma can interrupt the natural flow of, of self-discovery. Those of us who are going through our deconstruction journeys or those of us who are even still in the church, if you're honest, you, you can say that there's not a lot of talk about self-discovery in the church. What you really hear is the opposite. You're really taught not to discover yourself. You're taught that you are not to be trusted. Um, your flesh is not to be trusted, that you are a sinner, that you are worthless, that you are de inherently depraved. And so there's no there's no talk, um, no encouragement towards self-discovery. And so religious trauma interrupts that natural process. Um, as human beings, we are here to discover ourselves as humans, right? Religious trauma also impedes or interrupts decision-making abilities and it prevents us from living a life of peace and authenticity. Religious trauma can manifest itself in many ways and no two people will have the exact same experience. There are several typical signs and symptoms, however, that we often see in adults who experience religious trauma. And I'm gonna go through some of those now, some of those typical signs and symptoms. Again, you may not experience all of these, but chances are you probably have experienced one or two of these. Impeded or interrupted development. So that, that would be socially, emotionally, spiritually, or sexually. Okay, all of those areas of development tend to get in all or some of those areas of development tend to get interrupted through religious trauma because of religious trauma. We see depression, anxiety and other mental health concerns, which is why I'm focusing my research on mental health, because it's directly connected to religious trauma. Again, poor decision making skills, lack of self-confidence and self-esteem, a sense of isolation, pervasive feelings of guilt and shame. Difficulty forming healthy adult relationships, poor interpersonal boundaries, and then doctrinal confusion, things like fear of God, fear of death, fear of hell. And as I examined this list, which by the way, I did get from Dr. Marnell, um, when I looked at that list, I used this list to sort of guide and inform how I was going to create my program. And so I have a seven step trauma healing program uh, that addresses these signs and symptoms. The first step that I recommend, of course, is to seek mental health professional um, services, people who specialize in trauma recovery. Again, as African-Americans, that's gonna be difficult. One, because again, we have a cultural competence issue because we don't have a lot of black therapists and we really don't have any black therapists that specialize in religious trauma recovery. I remember the first therapist I talked to about religious trauma 
and he he's he hurt me so bad it was clear that he was not informed about religious trauma and he absolutely re-traumatized me because he was Christian and made it obviously clear that he wasn't able to separate his own biases. And so when I did the research, there's not, I really haven't found any black therapists who specialize in religious trauma. So you may have some trouble there finding somebody. And so because I know that African-Americans really prefer to do things in private, the rest of these steps are things that you can do in private should you choose not to seek professional help with your religious trauma recovery. Um, now, the second step is something that I call the rest method, although it is not my method. It's not my um, it's not my modality, but I just sort of renamed it and, and, and use some of the steps. But you can purchase a workbook uh, by McKay Brantley and Wood is a dialectical behavioral therapy skills workbook. And that's where this sort of rest method comes from. And so the rest method is a four step method to, that you can use immediately when you feel traumatized. And it's an acronym that stands for rest, relax, evaluate, set an intention and take action. So clearly I don't have time to go into all of the details of that four-step method, but it, it really works well in helping you to quickly um, switch from giving a, a reactionary response when you feel triggered. And this gives you time to create a more uh, conscious reaction when you feel triggered. The third step in my method is the self-discovery method, which is the bulk of what my program is about. Because again, when you've been traumatized by religion, you lose yourself. And so the self-discovery step in this process will help you to uh, find your authentic self. And it's a guide to offer you an evidence-based approach to reaching your highest human potential without the dogma and the indoctrination of religion. So again, these are evidence-based approaches that I have included in the program. I wanna talk about self-discovery for just a second because I think it's important in the African-American space because again, I'm talking about terms and terminology that are not frequently used in our communities. Um, I can't tell you how many people that I've spoken to in the last four years in the African-American space who had never ever heard of a lot of the terms that I use, terms like self-discovery, self-efficacy, self-agency, self-actualization. These are not terms that we are familiar with. And in fact, when you try to encourage African-Americans to use these modalities to make their lives better, to improve their experiences, they oftentimes feel insulted because again, we have an, a belief system that says we have to depend on God for everything. So this notion that I can depend on myself to, to improve my life is almost blasphemous in my community. So self-discovery will help you feel more confident and reduce, reduce or manage stress. It works by helping you to arrange your thoughts into a structured whole and to think about the different facets of your life. Practicing self-discovery can help you achieve the following. Address your feelings and develop greater emotional intelligence. Understand your strengths and boost self-confidence. Consider areas of needed improvement. Access your current situation and understand what is working in your life and what isn't. Understand how you react to certain situations and people so that you can change and modify those behaviors. Look at what or who you make time for, right? That's so important because everybody that's in your life may not need to be there. We tend to, especially those of us who are coming out of religion, we tend to have a host of dysfunctional relationships because we have this belief system that we're supposed to just love and be in fellowship with everybody. Also, uh, self-discovery helps when we're talking about considering which relationships we need to focus on and why. Clarifying our goals and whether or not you are effectively working towards those goals helps you make decisions and create solutions, helps you become stronger, more focused and more resilient person, and then clarify your dreams and develop an action plan to help you reach those goals. So again, these are all things that might be new to a lot of African-Americans because we're used to having to rely on God through prayer to figure out how to do these things. And a lot of us in this space, uh, we don't self-actualize. We don't reach our full human potential because in our minds, we haven't heard from God about what to do yet. So we tend to not do anything. So this puts the power back in your hands. Step four of my program is uh, self-affirmation and self-efficacy work. Again, this is to help individuals reach their full potential. Step five, there's a piece in here on critical thinking skills training 
you all know as well as I do that oftentimes when we have religious trauma experiences, we our critical thinking has been ripped from us. And so we don't often realize how important critical thinking is when we're talking about decisions that we're making in our life. If you don't know how to think critically, if you don't know how to think in an organized and rational manner, you may end up making some very toxic and destructive decisions. So there's a whole methodology on how to employ critical thinking skills. Step six is interpersonal skills uh, to help improve relationships. Again, and most of our relationships are dysfunctional uh, because of the trauma that we've experienced in religion. And so this program will assist you in learning how to get those interpersonal communication skills so that you can improve your relationships. And then the final step in my healing journey was just Bible basics. And I told you all in the beginning of the presentation that oftentimes we as African-Americans, the experience that we have or the allegiance we have to church, it's not so much about the biblical doctrine of Christianity so much as it's about uh, needing that that therapeutic experience, that emotional connection. And so oftentimes, a lot of people in this space don't even know why they believe the things they believe because they've never really studied the Bible. And so what I did in this program was I included just some Bible basics, because once you learn how to uh, critically think, you now can go take a look at these Bible doctrines and you can decide how many of these doctrines you want to keep or if you need to deconstruct from any or all of them. Okay, I think y'all, yes, drum roll. I think we are at the end. That is the end of my presentation. Um, if you want more information about my program or the work I do, please make sure you visit us at www.lifeafterchurch.org. If you want to even send me a message, that would be fine as well. So that is where my presentation concludes. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate that. Vanessa, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. This was wonderful and much needed. You know, you and I talked prior to this, and I think it's worth mentioning again. Uh, we had a couple of different religious trauma conferences prior to this one. And um, each time we have reached out to people of color, uh, Hispanic and black communities, and it's in the same response so many times, which is, I'm not going near that. I'm not going to touch on that. And not that there wasn't an awareness, but there was that fear of being ostracized, marginalized, hated, excommunicated. The amount of times I have heard from people of color that they when, especially when they engage in an academic study of religion, rather than more of an emotional, devout, uh, you know, religious and personalized approach to religion, there has just been so much pushback. And so for you to step up and take this step and open the door, I am just so incredibly thankful for that. Because you're saying this is an important topic and you, we can talk about it freely it's okay. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for being Absolutely. that. You know, um, I have so many notes. I have so many questions and comments. I want to get into some heavy stuff for sure. And some, com and, and some controversial stuff. But, you know, um, I guess one thing I want to bring up is um, you did rely on Marlene Wynell's work heavily. And that was, she was definitely kind of the forerunner for sure. Um, something worth mentioning is our religious trauma sociological study and how we come up with a different definition of religious trauma. I would love to get your opinion on it. Let me just, I just want to make sure I'm pulling it up correctly. Okay. Um, So I want to know if this if this is satis if this helps satisfy some of the um, critiques that you had of Wynell's definition, and also can help in the Black community. So we define religious trauma as an event, series of events, relationships, or circumstances within or connected to religious beliefs, practices, or structures that is experienced by an individual as overwhelming or disruptive 
and has lasting adverse effects on a person's physical, mental, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Thoughts, critiques. Do you think that this is a helpful definition? It is wordy. <laughs> it's very wordy. It's definitely a, an improvement on, on her definition. Um, it's definitely more expansive and more inclusive. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm going to advocate for even a little bit more inclusivity in, in your definition to include some of the things that we're talking about. Um, again, just, just so that people of color could feel like they're part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, not because we need or, or that we deserve, that we have to have more attention, but because there is already so much, uh, we, we already feel so much exclusivity uh, in, in these conversations. So uh, yes, your definition is definitely expanded and it's definitely an improvement but I would still like to see a little bit more specificity about our experience and the, and the trauma that we inherited from um, our experience with slavery. Well, you know, something that our definition doesn't necessarily account for uh, because it's very person and individualized uh, what you directly experience here and during your lifetime, but it doesn't seem to account for the generational trauma that could occur because of things like slavery. Um, it's very much. And I mean, that, I think, I think even not just in the African-American experience, but it could probably help for all of us. Right. Because again, when you talk about now that we know that it, that it's scientifically proven that, uh, these traumas, these these traumas can be inherited. I think if you, it could be inclusive for a lot of people, not just African Americans. So, right. yeah, generational trauma. Generational is- trauma. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, just maybe a general clause about that would be, even if you don't make it specific to to our experience, but yeah, I think just an, a general clause about that would be more inviting to a larger audience of people. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, you know, I wanted to touch on a couple of things that uh, I've personally observed, you know, um, as I mentioned with you before, my very first exposure to Christianity and and church community was a predominantly black uh, Pentecostal church. Yeah. And what I find so enlightening, I mean, my, it's just so eye opening and the light bulb goes off for me for a whole bunch of different reasons and future studies is this notion that church for the black community is cathartic. It is counseling services. And I think back to my experiences in my black church going, watching kind of the ritualistic and sometimes the, the stereotypical shouting, hooting and hollering, running around the congregation, throwing money at the altar, all of these things, and now putting it in the context that maybe some of this is in fact a releasing of generational trauma out of the nervous system, albeit maybe not as effective as, as actual trauma therapy, um, but as a way of releasing some of that going back to what you said that so many black people aren't studying the bible they this is an emotional experience form it's a counseling service yes yes is so enlightening i think it's so important and then i want to relate that to one other thing and then i promise i'm not going to dominate um you're fine i remember i remember um during my days in seminary and we were i i i I want to say it was in my evangelism class, but whatever it was, there was a heavy emphasis on the kingdom and the hereafter. And there is a story in one of my textbooks. It's always stayed with me. And the story, it was being shared as a great thing. And now you look back on it and you go, ooh, I'm kind of toxic. It was the story of a black grandmother sitting at her granddaughter's recital or or something. And the grandma looks miserable. The granddaughter looks at grandma and says, why are you, are you not happy? Are are you not enjoying yourself? And she says, baby, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here when Jesus returns. Um, Is this constant 
focus on the hereafter and the future as opposed to the here and now and thinking about how that can lead to a stagnation in a community yes. uh, an inability or an, an, an uh, no desire to want to see dramatic change yes thoughts yeah i mentioned that in the presentation today and 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 so when you again when you go back to um it goes back to the conversation of post-traumatic slave syndrome where if if our ancestors 500 years ago had no hope if your here and now is full of abuse if your here and now is full of trauma and violence and watching people be unalived and lynched and raped. You don't want to be here either. So the only thing you have to hold on to is a futuristic hope because your present hope um, is, is very dark. And so again, when you think about the possibility of inheriting that, That and so the in, in inheriting inheriting it so much so that it's actually in your that it's in your DNA that it's 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 a part of your your chemical makeup that belief there, uh, and and how we've passed that on, you can start to see why when you look statistically, in this country, in the African American experience, why we tend to kind of trail behind. It's not because we're in that we lack intelligence even though when I was growing up, that's, that's the message that was perpetuated in a lot of our homes. There was this belief that we just were not as smart as other people, specifically white people. Now that we're getting more information, that's not it at all. We did not strive to meet certain benchmarks of success because we had no hope. And so we, we inherited this desire to just wait for the, the afterlife and so I mentioned today in my presentation how when I was going through this deconstruction and talking out loud about challenging people about the existence of heaven and why there was so much, I mean, just downright fury because, because did we just inherit that as, what if that's our only belief? What if that's the only thing that gives us hope? What if that's all we have to look forward to? If you take that from a hopeless people, God, what, what would be the results of that? And if so, you, if you're challenged, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you're challenging that mindset, then you're going to get the backlash as well. You're going to get the back. Ask me how I know. I'm still putting my head back together. <laughs> sure. So when I mentioned in the presentation, when I start talking about things like self-efficacy and self-agency and self-actualization, again, those conversations are blasphemous in my community, most of the people in my community have not heard those terms, not because they're not intelligent enough, but because we have not been exposed to that conversation. What we were exposed to is conversations about survival. Listen to the to the national Negro hymns and you hear, we're just trying to, we're just trying to make it over until Jesus come back for us, until the Lord comes back. So this idea of, of the rapture, this idea of Jesus coming to rescue us, this, is, this has been a prevailing school of thought in the community for hundreds of years. And so now people like me, and I'm not saying that I'm the only one, I'm just speaking because I just know me, who were saying, hey, guess what? And even if you still want to believe in heaven, I'm not trying to take that away from people. I'm asking people, though, are you willing to divert your attention away from heaven? And are you willing to focus here while you're here in this present moment? So then teaching things like mindfulness and, and teaching people in my community how to be in the present moment. These are new concepts mm. that have to be taught and they have to be taught with patience because they're just new and they're scary for us. They were scary for me when I began this journey. I got to be honest with you. I thought I was a reasonably intelligent woman. But when I officially started this deconstruction in 2019, I can't tell you how many new concepts came into my awareness that I had never entertained before. So if I feel that way, and I was reasonably intelligent and in, in even actually studying the Bible, can you imagine how scary some of these conversations could feel to somebody who doesn't know these concepts? Which is why I'm now asking people in the deconstruction community, white and black, 
Hispanic, whatever you are, we who are on the other side, who are doing some of this research and we're looking at this information and we can be so quick to just assume that everybody is going to get it. No, everybody's lived experience is not like ours. And so these conversations can feel very threatening to people who are not exposed to this information. Even people, I have people in my life who are very educated in the black community. I know lawyers and doctors and professionals who have degree after degree and they still, when I present some of this information, they still turn a deaf ear towards me. So it's not about the intelligence from, I think it's about how that trauma blinds us and it deafens us. So I think that's why in my business, what I try to do is when people come to me for help is let's address your trauma first because they always want to they always want to know what book should I read or what religion should I practice in none of that let's heal that trauma first because if you don't address all the trauma and the memories in the brain no matter what move you try to make next those memories are going to still haunt you you're going to still be in fight flight yeah so this- for our community we're going to have to have those kind of high level conversations about trauma and the brain and and things that we're just not aware of and this explains so many of the knee jerk reactions that I have repeatedly heard of. Um, yeah, I want to be mindful of our time. So I'm going to give a, we're going to end up going over our time uh, slot, which is okay. So let's do about 15 more minutes. I have a couple of controversial things that I'm going to just go ahead and uh, get out of the way before we open it up to the uh, general Q and a and questions, comments. Um, would it be fair to say that uh you know, during slavery times and hell, probably uh, all the way through Jim Crow, that white slave masters, white oppressors are the predominant maybe uh, instigators of the trauma, but maybe today, would it be fair to say that the, the instigators of trauma within the black community are black pastors, black ministers, and black congregants? Absolutely. But it's also fair to say, absolutely, that's fair. But it's also fair to know that they learned that from this from the slave masters, right. from the generations before them. But yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, what immediately. You remember, remember, remember that photo of the black minister standing there. But everything he learned, he learned from who? The slave master. Right. You know, and I, uh, we had a talk yesterday about Rene Girard's mimetic theory and this idea of imitation. You, you're just imitating the abuser. That Absolutely. The cycle continues. The Absolutely. Real co- controversial thing I want to bring up, and this will be, so I'll try to be as sensitive as I can, but also aware of time. Yes. The uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. This one is incredibly hard for me to comprehend, clearly. Um, The idea that slavery is still traumatic. As a white man, I go, uh, I've heard this, I've said this, and it's because of my lived experience, I cannot, you know, I can't existentially comprehend where I say, but you were never a slave. How is it still impacting you now? Uh, and, and I love, I love that you um, are, uh, we now know about the generational trauma. So I'm not questioning the slave syndrome. Uh, experientially, it's hard for me to comprehend as a white male, what uh, my controversial kind of question is. Um, what I see as being discussed, especially in the white community is that what we feel like <laughs> I'm trying to talk for all white people on uh, clearly, uh, but in the circle I have run in, um, the, I think the angst is that there's this, now this lashing out against whites by the way. Okay. Black. okay. So we're being punished for the sins of some of our ancestors. Mm-hmm. So pretend with me for the sake of argument that maybe there is a little bit of lashing out against okay. whites. Um, Mm -hmm. whether that's real or not, uh, um, Mm -hmm. if it is in fact real, would that lashing out be considered maybe a trauma response 
in the black community? Or am I completely off base with that? Slightly off base, slightly, I get it. So just imagine if you were in an abusive situation And, and no one was in all around you, like in your neighborhood, your neighbors, and you went to your, your job and you try to tell your coworkers, you try to tell all these people. And everybody just kept saying, you know, just be quiet already. So imagine going through an abusive situation and then feeling as though you're silenced and not heard. Um, imagine if every place you went just to do your daily living reminded you of your, your abuse. So for black people, mm. so one, again, it, you, we, I, we, we are asking white people to, to respect science um, because I know even for myself being in the space with white people who are deconstructing, the conversation always goes left when I start talking about, we agree on a lot of the theological stuff, but when I start talking about this issue, then I, the, we have problems, right? But if you respect science and you respect that trauma is inherited and that we can in inherit, you know, even emotional traumas for generations and generations, it should not be hard to understand it from that perspective. Okay, so we hear all the time, well, we didn't do it, I, we didn't do it, but then you didn't do it directly, but we still live in a country that perpetuates many of the same mindsets that existed during that time. We still have systemic racism in terms of the laws that are on the books. We still um, have to deal with patriarchy and we have to still deal with uh, this sort of mis misogynoir as a black woman, just not feeling loved and appreciated by white people. We are not getting the empathy. So for a lot of us, we just want empathy from white people. Empathy would empathy could could fix a lot of this if we could get white people to say, I understand and how can I help? Like, because I'm not accusing you of doing anything to me because you clearly didn't do anything to me. Right? I'm just asking you, and I'm and I'm just using you as an example. I'm just asking you to empathize with understanding that we have a systemic racism problem in this country. I just told you, even in the mental health arena, we don't even have black therapists that we can go to oftentimes. So everywhere we go, the majority of people who are in leadership are white people. Hmm. The financial districts, white people are in charge of that. We haven't had, we had one black president in how many years? And even he wasn't 100% black, you know, um, when you, so all of the major systems in place are run by white people. So you, I expect white people to, to not understand because of the, the privilege. You can't see it because everything is written to support who you are. So of course you wouldn't see it. Yeah. Any more than I could, when I was not deconstructing this actively, the same things that I teach now, and when I heard somebody else say that stuff five years ago, I called them demons too. You demon, you are such a heretic. Because I couldn't see. Oh no. So we're gonna have to have. And so there might be some lashing back. It's very possible because when you're frustrated, sometimes you lash out. So I, I, you know, but I think what a lot of what you all are seeing is just the frustration of black people and feeling that we're not heard and that we're not, that we're being silenced and that we're not understood. And every time I hear a white person say, I can't understand why this is still a problem. I can't understand why white people can't understand that it's a problem. You know what I mean? What I'm hearing is uh, there's a general minimizing and, and, and even trivializing of the generational trauma, if it's even acknowledged, and that the entire environment, just the existence here is triggering. And this is an important topic. I bring this up because 
Um, one, a significant people who will be watching and learning and, and the researchers and specialists in religious trauma tend to be white. And so white people need to be informed. We need to understand. Um, and it's so important for us to be able to dialogue and have this conversation that we can actually bring up complex and, and harsh and, and sensitive issues without yeah. one about each other down or cancel each other. <laughs> right. You know? Uh, and how dare, how dare a white guy even talk about it? Um, yes. No, we need to talk about it because we can part. I want to, I want to be informed better mm-hmm. well, uh, with that. So that was the main thing I wanted to get in. Um, let's open it up. Let's do five more minutes of uh, questions, comments from the audience. So anybody and anybody from the audience, you can uh, show your video. You can unmute yourself. Uh, feel free. And there are a couple of questions already in the chat box that if they don't want to ask them directly, I can field those questions as well. Would anybody like to start their video or unmute themselves? I would be willing to speak a little bit to what I put. I. Actually provide some insight on like how we as white folks can help elevate your voices in the specifically like the religious trauma realm um, and how we can provide a space for that conversation a little more. Well, I think what what's happening today is the first step in the right direction, because as uh, Darren and I have both already mentioned that we don't have black voices in the religious trauma space. And I've, I've tried to share why that is today, or at least part of why it is. Um, so t- I'd like to see us taken seriously, you know, in this space. Um, I'd like to see more opportunities given to us to share our lived experiences. Again, to, to make these definitions and to make these concepts more inclusive of the black experience. Um, because when I, again, when I read the, the resources and the data that's out there, even though nobody is saying I'm writing this to white people, when I'm reading this information, I can tell that it's it's from a, a white person's perspective. And so even though we do have some shared experiences in Christianity, there is a different experience shared by African-Americans in Christianity. And so just giving voice like we're doing today would be a great place to start. So invite us, include us, ask our thoughts, ask our opinions, listen to what we're saying and try not to take things seriously when the issue of race does come up or not seriously and try not to take things, uh, try not to be offended when we do have to bring up the conversation of race. I think most of us know that we're not blaming any white person alive today for what was what was done to us 500 years ago. I think that's obvious. But I try to bring in the scientific perspective such as post-traumatic slave uh, syndrome and inherited trauma because I'm trying to center the conversation in science so that it it doesn't feel so offensive to white people. If we have a conversation about science, my prayer is that white people won't take this personally when we have to have these difficult conversations. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question, thanks. Uh, I was gonna uh, ask uh, Tricia, but Pam, go for it. Um, And then Tricia, I saw that you, had a question in the chat as well. So um, I'll field the question for you if you want, or I would love to hear from you after Pam is done. So Vanessa, thank you. You are so articulate and I'm, I'm really appreciating what you're doing. Um, you. And I wanted to, um, you know, this inherited trauma, it sounds like it's so long ago and I'm sure that's not what you mean. I think maybe how white people hear it sometimes. But in the beginning of my career, I met a wonderful man who was uh, helping my congregation uh, learn about the history of African American religious music. Um, and his family had long generations. You know, that meant that some of the people in the family would have their children in, se- in their 70s. And his mother had a, had him when she was very late in life and her mother had had her late in life, but his grandma was a slave. 
I mean, it was just like, and, and so this is, we're talking about the um, 1980s, early 90s. And so this idea that somehow this trauma is so far away, oh my gosh, you know, because we can start, uh, it can start, the, sto the narrative can start 500 years ago. It just doesn't take into account that uh, people have been able to touch other people who experience slavery in the African-American community. And where I am now, um, most of the um, BIPOC um, work is with Native Americans. And um, there's there are two uh, Lutheran pastors in our synod whose mothers were um, nearly destroyed by the residential school and then went on to have children, them. And um, the compassion that they learn and still have to live with, you know, in dealing with their extended family is because of immediate destruction of mental and spiritual and identity based health um, that was a result from the uh, residential schools. So the, um, this, um, this idea that somehow this, um, that, uh, you know, when you say people are, you get tired of people, white people saying, why can't you get over it? Well, it's not that far away, is it? No. And in fact, you mentioned that I, I, I wrote on my paper before I started. This is a, this is about five great grandparents back. So I'm one of those people who also had an older parent. She wasn't 70, but my mother was 41 and my father was 50 four when I was born. My my Aunt Bessie, who's no longer with us, she left us her home. I was down there yesterday. It is an actual slave plantation, y'all. And there are still slave houses on my Aunt Bessie's property that I'm able to touch and see and feel. So I'm glad that you make the point that I think for a lot of people, black and white, that we 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 we've historized this to be two billion years ago <laughs> and it's not that long ago no that's i am one of those people who my great grandmother was a slave y'all hmm. okay yeah Again, and i, I, I knew, knew my great grandmothers own, i'm sure you knew her yeah right? absolutely yeah so i i own a slave plantation that i inherited from my aunt just wow. to put this into context and every time we have to step on that property for all my life, we had, and I just yesterday I was down there and you can still feel that energy of what happened. So just to put it in a little bit of perspective, thank you so much for even mentioning that. My, my pleasure. I like that. Um, yeah. And we're not even talking a generation ago when we were still dealing with the Jim Crow South and things like that. So yeah, um, putting that time period, uh, that is a great perspective. Uh, you know, Pam, uh, you had mentioned before in the, one of the comments, something that I wanted to say as well, and I'm so just glad that you brought it up. Um, this idea, and this is, this actually seems to be across the board, but Vanessa, you touched on this, this idea that, um, all I got to do is just turn to God. If I pray enough, if I stand on his word enough, if I, maybe if I tithe enough and give offerings to the altar, things like that, then I will be healed. But you can't do that. You're not going to pray yourself out of trauma. No. And so this then just compounds it because when the depression, anxiety, nightmares, all that stuff doesn't go away, then you are now cursing yourself. I mm -hmm. must be displeased with me or I must not be. Right. I'm not doing it right. And the yep. tra keeps more trauma. Yeah. The cycle of trauma. You know, um, Trisha has a question and I think it's an important one. She asked, do you think that mental health is not offered in black churches because it promotes individualism? Uh, if we start to think critically in one area, it could cause us to start thinking critically in other areas also. Would you agree with that or more nuanced? I think it's nuanced. I, I think that could be for some, but for most people, this is just what the research and the data says. That's not why. Again, it is because of our theological beliefs about um, mental health. Um, 
So when you talk about individualism, again, as I mentioned earlier, these are not concepts that African-Americans for the most part are entertaining in their conversations anyway, because again, the reliance and the dependency is on God and or the clergy. Remember in the presentation, I talked about how African-Americans see the clergy as this buffer or the bridge from between themselves and God. So I don't think it's because they're trying to prevent individualism. I think it's because they're not aware of the concept at all for the most part, which is why I'm trying to do the work that I'm doing to introduce these concepts to our community. Mm. Yeah. Um, there, it, it's almost an underlying subtext of uh, uh, an insidious, I don't want you thinking for yourself because uh, in, in a way that does seem to be a subtext, but it isn't maybe the overt reason. It may not be the overt on the it's biblical. The Bible tells you not to. For those pastors who are reading the Bible, the Bible tells you not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. The Bible tells you don't lean into your own understanding. The Bible tells you that in your flesh dwells no good thing. So it's not because they don't want people to, to experience individualism. They're trying to uphold to these biblical or these theological principles that have been ha handed down to them for generations. It's inherent to the institution. Yeah, exactly. And I tell people, you know, in my community, when, when you when they're deconstructing, I really want to see people in really in all spaces, redirect some of that anger energy, take it away from the church and put it on the system itself, because the system is the real adversary here. Hmm. These are these are biblical principles that need to be that need to be deconstructed as well. So even if black people were introduced to concepts about individualization and self-actualization, which is kind of what my research is about. I, I want to look at, you know, how willing are African-Americans to integrate some modern interventions with their theological beliefs? Like how willing are you to do that? Because that's what it's, that's the only thing that's going to probably help our people is if we can find a way to let them somehow hold on to some of those theological beliefs and introduce them to some new modern interventions as well. Interesting. I'm curious, we, in our sociology study that uh, we just released, the first part of it, mm -hmm. that uh, one out of three um, U.S. adults have had religious trauma at least at some point in their life, and we estimate about 20% of U.S. adults currently suffer from multiple debilitating symptoms of religious trauma. So that's a lot. Right. Well, and you know, uh, the, as expected, actually one of the biggest pushbacks that we get uh, from clinicians and, and researchers is that the number is still too low, <laughs> which, you know, as you, as you indicate, uh, or as you already know, uh, self-reporting and, and this and that, it's always going to kind of be a bit undercutting, but we were purposely conservative with our numbers um, but I'm curious if I realize that probably nothing is, has been done on it. And so this is definitely a gap that we need to get researchers on, but if you had to guess in just the black community, do you have an estimation of uh, a guess of how many might be suffering from religious trauma? If one in five U S adults currently suffer from it now, do you think it would be higher than 20% in the black community? I do. If I had to guess, if we, if, if, if the, if that, if the, if the research would leave space for like secondary trauma, and I forgot what the, what the term for that is, because you have direct trauma that you experienced yourself, but you also can experience trauma through, through like, secondhand trauma kind of thing. So if we were to factor in all of that, I think the numbers in the African-American experience would be staggering because black people attend church more than any other people group on this planet. That's research. I've got so much data on that. Black people utilize religious coping to survive more than anybody else. If you were to take that away from them, if you were to take their religious coping strategies away from them, I 
think a lot of us would be gone. Mm. It, I would probably be bold enough to say one out of one out of two of us or, or five out of five of us. And I'm being really serious right now. Yeah. If you if they allowed me to factor in everything that I've looked at, I would say it'll probably four out of five. When and the only people who probably haven't experienced it are people who had no interaction with the church at all. But even if you didn't go to church, like take my son. Well, let's just let's just let's just make up something because this happens a lot. Like if a child didn't go to church. But their mama or their grandmama went to church. They're going to rear that child up in their theological in their faith. So that child is still a product of that trauma, even though they themselves are not directly believe in the same things, but they're still a product of it. So in that regard, I would say probably four out of five African-Americans are experiencing forms of trauma. And when I'm now that I'm having these conversations with more people and I'm explaining what trauma is and what it looks like and what the, you know, they're like, oh yeah, that would be me. But see, they didn't know. They didn't know what this term meant. So I'm guessing that probably four out of five African-Americans have experienced some some level of religious trauma. I certainly have, and I'm still working through it. I mean, I feel it while I'm talking about this stuff. I feel my body just the nervousness, the 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 I feel I feel it moving through my body as I have these conversations. And so uh yeah, it's it's and I wonder like in your study, did you include African Americans in your study? Absolutely. Or did you you did? Okay. It's uh, and it's fully comprehensive of the general makeup of the U.S. Okay. population. And so you're saying that clinicians are thinking that one out of three is not high enough to, to, to investigate it more? No, no, no. That, uh, what, no, no, that, um, that the real numbers is like oh. them, them one out of three as the, of the general U S population. Oh, I see. Okay. Gotcha. Um, in other words, the problem is worse. Mm-hmm what we can detect at the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to see a study on this that is zeroing in more because ours was more generalized to the general population um, and not zeroed in on specific communities. So I would love to see that. I mean, that's, that's where the research needs to go. Absolutely. I started to do that, but I, I go to a Christian university still <laughs> and I didn't know how, comfortable I'd be talking to my community about all that. Well, um, but I started to do that. Saying that. That when we factor in generational stuff, and even in our in our study, we mentioned that no, you don't actually have to be a participant or directly involved in a religious institution to have undergone religious trauma because of the pervasiveness and influence and widespread toxicity of certain religious teachings or practices or just the culture in general. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I want, uh, I wanted to say thank you so much. This was incredibly enlightening. I absolutely loved your presentation. So I'm so thankful for you. Um, step you. in such an uncomfortable zone with me. I know, <laughs> I know it's you. And thank you for entertaining some controversial discussions as well. I really appreciate that. So, absolutely. I do want to tell everybody, uh, thank you so much for coming and attending. And we do have another presentation coming up in about five minutes. So I hope I'll see everybody a little bit later and throughout the day. Vanessa, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, Let me give you the last word. Uh, I don't, let's see. Thank you for having me. First of all, I really, really appreciate this. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you so much for the work that each of you are doing in your, in your respective places. And, uh, let's all heal together y'all. All All right. Grace and peace y'all. I'm going to be talking about how the body and brain, what they're finding is that trauma gets trapped in our nerves. as a contributing factor in complicated. This is the